Hello everyone, um, I appreciate you visit to this channel, um, Carlos Astronomy. And on this channel, I regularly produce videos about space, about the Moon, um, Mars, latest Perseverance robot images, Curiosity robot images, and other topics. So please subscribe. Um, Press the bell to be notified and then you'll be um, aware of all these videos that I regularly upload to my channel. Now today I would like to um, talk about Artemis 1 which is going to the moon this Monday 29th of August and the mission will be launched at about 8.33 Eastern Time um, there is a two-hour window for this mission, so fingers crossed, everything goes well, and um, and the Artemis goes goes away as according to plan. Um, it has been over 51 years since we allegedly last walked on the moon. The last manned mission um, was in December 1972 with the Apollo 17. Uh, that mission lasted for about 12 days. Um, the astronauts managed to do long walks and returned a lot of samples from the Moon. Um, John F. Kennedy's pledge to go to the Moon uh, before the end of the 70s materialized when we landed on the Moon uh, with the Apollo 11 in 1969. Um, then Apollo 12 came, 13, 14, um, and then Apollo 17. After Apollo 17, all the trips to the moon were cancelled. Um, the reason for this cancellation, according to, to NASA, um, was due to large funding cuts. There, there was no money, and traveling to the moon was hugely expensive. Besides, the political um, atmosphere in America wasn't great, and there was a lot of a lot a loss of interest in um, research and development, and also space travel and exploration in general. So, no more trips to the moon. All the trips were cancelled, and now, now we're going back. Now we're going back. Um, as of Monday, Artemis 1 will launch. Why are we going back? Why are we going back? Um, I would say that there are two main reasons, uh, personally, for going back to the moon. One is financial gain and control. And the second one is survival of the species. And let me talk about the first one, financial gain and control. Um, I'd, I'd like to draw your attention to this footage of the moon. Um, let, me, let me restart this. Uh, I took this footage back in June this year, um, nearly a full moon. Um, I mounted a, my Nikon D5600 um, on a two times bar low, and I mounted that on my Celestron 11 scope. Now you can clearly see darker areas on the moon. Um, you see the, the Sea of Storms, or Oceanum Procellarum on the left, and then the Sea of Serenity, the light area. To the right is the Sea of Tranquility, which is darker, and then to the right again, at the top, you will see uh, the sea of fecundity, mea fecunditatis, and at, at the very top is the sea of crisis, mea crisium. So you notice that the, there are areas on the moon that are darker in color, and some others are lighter. Now, the, darker, the darker areas are full of basaltic material, which is very rich in. <clears throat> in compounds, in minerals. So basically, throughout the 
the years, uh, thousands, millions of years, the, the moon is being, has been bombarded uh, by volatiles, solar wind. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of material and minerals that have been accumulated under the regolith, which is basically the, the moon sun. So this material has accumulated and it's not too, too deep, so it's probably three, five meters. You could extract those volatiles and, and break them down. So there is a huge financial gain in exploiting the moon because if we manage to, to bring these resources back to Earth, it will be beneficial to, to many industries. So um, as an example, titanium dioxide is the, it's a pigment and it's, there are tons of it on the moon. Titanium dioxide is, is used in many, many industries on Earth, cosmetics, uh, construction, uh, the food industry. Um, so there is um, a huge, um, it's a multi-trillion dollar industry basically, and there is not enough of it. So we're getting, we're getting short of it. So it will be a financial gauge to get this on the moon and bring it back. Now, the, the other thing, um, that I mentioned about control. So I believe that whoever controls space controls the world. And that's why we have this race where, um, you know, you, you get all these countries trying to, to go to the moon and to space and to Mars and all these satellites being deployed. So if you control a space, you control communication medium and then you control everything basically. So that's the first reason that I believe it is why we're going back to the moon. The second one, um, the second one is survival of the species. And for humanity to to push <coughs> to push its boundaries and conquer space, we will have to be able to survive in extreme and isolated environments. So um, we will need to overcome gravity we will need to overcome radiation as well. So survival of humanity might depend on establishing colonies, establishing bases on the moon and beyond, you know, asteroids, Mars, and then move beyond. Because if something happens to Earth, then those colonies will guarantee um, the continuation of humanity. Uh, you know, somewhere else. So if, if something strikes Earth and then everything gets destroyed, still there will be colonies in there that will um, propagate um, somewhere else. So survival of the species is an important reason that pushes us to go into the moon and perhaps use the moon as an outpost to launch beyond the moon, to Mars and beyond. And this is the, the idea of Artemis project, basically, which I will talk about that later on. So now, um, if I, the, the advantage that we have right now is that with the experience that we have with the International Space Station, we already know a little bit about, a little bit about um, living in a space uh, under zero gravity. So for the, past, for the past 20 years, we've been going to sending astronauts to the International Space Station. And um, this experience uh, has allowed us to, to create uh, better technologies, better suited um, space you know, gadgets, space suits for the astronauts. Uh, better propulsion and habitation and logistics systems as well. And this can be integrated into a single rocket, basically, and that's what we're trying to do with Artemis 1. So Artemis, Artemis 1 comprises not just the capsule, Orion, but also the space um, uh, launching rocket system, the SLS, and also um, the communication systems on Earth, and I'll, I'll, we'll go into that later on. 
as well as um, satellite, small satellites that can be deployed uh, when we get into orbit. So NASA really wants to uh, put humans on the moon by 2024. Um, that's, a, that's a big task. 2024 is not part of 2024. Um, put humans on the moon and establish a base in there. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned, the idea is to have a sustainable lunar exploration campaign uh, mid to late 20s establish a robust human robotic multinational presence on the moon because this effort and this is the Artemis program effort it's not just um, NASA and the US um, promoting or sponsoring this it's led by largely by American industries but it's supported by the Canadian Space Agency the European Space Agency, ESA, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, and also Russian Space Agency, Roscosmos. So it's, a, it's an international um, operation. They have contributed with modules, with technology for the Artemis program in general. And um, yeah, it's a joint effort. So let me... Um, jump into um, Artemis uh, program in more detail. So NASA has identified already areas on the moon for landing. The moon is full of resources, full of minerals, rich in TiO2. And also in the South Pole, NASA has identified certain areas that um, will be appropriate for landing. Um, Artemis 2 and Artemis 3, so which will involve crewed, crew mission to the moon. Uh, astronauts will land in this area. And the reason for identifying these areas is based on um, the resources, one, and two, the variety of topography. So this South Pole area has got huge um, mountains and also huge depressions. So areas where the sunlight never reaches and um, the topographical diversity in there uh, provides a, an environment to explore and know more about the, news, the moon. Besides, there's a lot of water ice in the South Pole, millions of tons of water ice. And um, if we manage to break this water ice down, then we will have enough water uh, for for a base to survive. Uh, if we break down this water ice, then we will, will, will have oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. So besides having those resources to, to survive, to breathe, uh, we will also have propulsion fuel. We can use nitrogen and hydrogen as propulsion fuel to, to move beyond, beyond the moon and go to Mars or somewhere else. So, um, besides, uh, there's a lot of minerals like um, iron and calcium on the moon, and so this can facilitate agriculture um, on these uh, bases on the moon. So, yeah, 13 areas have been identified. Uh, now, with the help of Artemis, um, they will finalize exactly where the, the, the landing will happen uh, near 2024 with Artemis 2 and Artemis 3. Right, so the, the moon, I mean, the moon is, is far away. So uh, it's about 250,000 miles away. It's, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a distance um, to go to the moon and to come back. Quite a big distance. Uh, Mars is um, 140 million miles. Uh, that's, that's a long way. Uh, so having an outpost on the moon will help facilitate going back and forth. And, um, and the Artemis project is, is, is basically that, you know, um, having a, an integrated system that allows to travel beyond the moon. 
Now, we to travel to the moon and beyond, really, we need to, have, to be able to carry larger payloads. We need to have tested the capsule and the communications that support humans throughout the whole journey out into space and back to Earth. We need an orbiting, orbiting platform as well. Um, and this is the gateway uh, in project that we have you know, to orbit the moon and provide that, that facility to host deep space experiments. Um, and we also need a powerful launch system, which we already have, which is the SLS. Uh, it's been tested. And um, uh, Artemis 1 will integrate all this into one single rocket. Uh, uh, the, the, the purpose is basically to test it thoroughly with Artemis 1, go, go to the moon, it's an uncrewed mission, no people in there, going to the moon, orbit the moon, study the area, stay there for a while because it will be approximately, uh, I mean, it, it launches on Monday, it won't come back until, is it October, early October? So it's quite a few days um, that, um, that will pass before splash down back on Earth. So, um, now, um, throughout this journey, Artemis will, will um, receive comprehensive communication and navigation services from NASA's two networks, the NIA Space Network, this is on the ground on Earth, and the Deep Space Network. So, and these services are actually paramount for um, during launch, during orbit, during re-entry. Basically, essential for all those, all aspects, all phases of the mission. Uh, now, this first test obviously will help NASA prepare all this network, make sure everything works to perfection uh, for the future, you know, manned voyages, um, trips that we, we will do to, to, the, to the moon and later on to, to Mars. Um, let me um, <clears throat> let me run this video from NASA, which um, which uh, explains things quite nicely, actually. So um, just give me one second. Um, I'll activate the the video. Uh, I need to sort out the. Uh, the, uh, the properties for this video, which um, the sound needs to be correct, so just one second, please. Uh, there you go, so let me just activate the sound for that. Right, so there we go. Let's uh, start, so let's run it so from the beginning. <clears throat> the Artemis 1 mission is an uncrewed flight test of the Orion spacecraft, placing a human-rated crew vehicle into lunar orbit for the first time since the Apollo missions. The mission will showcase the capabilities of both Orion and the Space Launch System, or SLS, NASA's powerful new rocket. Communication services for the Artemis 1 mission are provided by NASA's two major networks, the Near Space Network and the Deep Space Network. For Artemis 1 launch, the Near Space Network's launch communication segment provides critical links with SLS and Orion. The network's constellation of tracking and data relay satellites, or TDRS, provides near continuous communication services to the mission during ascent and low Earth orbit. As Artemis 1 journeys to the moon, the Deep Space Network acts as the mission's primary service provider beyond low Earth orbit with the Near Space Network providing supplemental navigation data. The Deep Space Network will maintain communications with Orion while in distant retrograde orbit around the Moon. The network will also help facilitate communications for all of the mission's CubeSat deployment stops. Returning to Earth, Orion will receive communication support from the Deep Space Network with assistance from the Near Space Network's TDRS constellation. TDRS will be integral to communications during re-entry and splashdown with NASA search and rescue technology standing by in case of contingencies. Artemis 1 will begin a new era of lunar exploration, supported by NASA space communications and navigation innovation. NASA's networks are empowering our sustained return to the moon as we set our sights 
on Mars. Okay, that's nice. Uh, explains everything. So credit to NASA um, for that video. Um, so basically, Artemis One will be the test. To make sure everything is integrated. Make make sure everything works together. And then later on next year, uh, a crewed mission will go to the moon. By the time we would have selected the regions to land and start exploring and settle uh, settlement on the moon um, now this one more thing uh, when 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 orion deploys it will actually deploy um, something called uh, the ice cube satellite and this little satellite will orbit the moon and will find water regions where we have lots of water because water on the moon is abundant on the regolith on the thin atmosphere on the south pole so much and as I mentioned, um, it's paramount that we find this water, we break it down, and the byproducts of it will allow us to survive and to move somewhere else. I'd like to run this um, NASA video uh, about the Ice Cube satellite, which is quite neat as well. Um, let's take a look at it. Uh, as the Artemis missions... Let me sort out the, the audio for that one. Uh, give me one second. Uh, where is it? Right, so there you go. And let's play. Journey to the moon. Finding and understanding water will be key to establishing a renewed presence there. Water is critical to life and can be. So, uh, the ice cube. Okay, let's try it again. <clears throat> Skips, uh, right, just the wrong one, apologies. Now it should, we should have sound on that one. And let's try it. As the Artemis mission's journey to the moon, finding and understanding water will be key to establishing a renewed presence there. Water is critical to life and can be broken into hydrogen and oxygen, which can serve as rocket fuel. The Lunar Ice Cube mission, led by Moorhead State University, carry a NASA instrument called Birches to investigate water and ice on the moon. Lunar Ice Cube is a small satellite designed to provide observations at diverse lunar regions to better understand the moon's water cycle. NASA scientists will use Birches data to understand where water is, what its origins are, and how we can use it. Birches will also help map water in the exosphere, an extremely thin volume of atmosphere surrounding the moon. Scientists are interested in understanding the absorption and release of water in the moon's regolith, dust and rocks on the lunar surface. This research will help scientists and engineers better understand changes to water on the moon over time. Birches uses a similar technology that flew on the OSIRIS-REx mission, which studied the asteroid Bennu. However, Birches has been miniaturized to one-sixth the mass of the instrument on OSIRIS-REx and is roughly the size of an eight-inch tissue box. The Lunar Ice Cube spacecraft and Birch's instrument will launch as a secondary payload on the Artemis 1 mission, helping pave the way for future crewed exploration missions to the lunar surface. Uh, that's lovely. Nice little um, video explaining everything about the Ice Cube satellite. Right, so as to summarize, um, you know, fingers crossed, everything goes well. Um, on Monday and uh, we are able to launch successfully and then we wait six weeks later when when the Artemis one comes back so fingers crossed thanks for watching bye